I'm Stuart Woods, a Managing Director for Oxford Instruments Nanoscience. I, I think it's quite interesting, um, growing up, uh, you know, of, of, a, of a child of the 80s, right, you know, one of the things you always imagined was these giant Craig, uh, uh, Cray computers, right, and, uh, you know, they were massive and they always had funny shapes and, you know, massive power plants to support them. But all that's evolved, right? And with the advent of the internet and us all being connected, it, it, everything's evolved. I mean, with PCs and laptops being, you know, you know, a commodity now, those giant monolithic supercomputers have now evolved into uh, individual blade systems that are housed in amazing eco farms that uh, now are configurable uh, according to wherever you are in the world, right? So if you and I wake up tomorrow and we want uh, a computer of you know, so many teraflops, we can just go in and, and configure it and, and decide on that. So you know, what's happened is instead of having this single monolithic structure, you now have this scalable horizontal platform, which is now both a combination of storage and computational power in this massive eco warehouse uh, somewhere in the world, right? And it doesn't matter where it is. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the location uh, and, and how fast you can get to that particular uh, site, you know, from wherever you're accessing it from. Server farms today are things that we touch and we don't even know it. I mean, you know, most of the consumer platforms now that we use and access on our, on our laptop or even our phone, the data is, is partially stored somewhere in the cloud, and that cloud is, in essence, a massive horizontal supercomputer that can be configured both for processing, say, for example, images or AI, AI activities around images, or actually just generally storing that data. So to a large extent, even, even our bank, banking data is at some level on an enterprise you know, supercomputer cloud server element. Uh, so we're touched by it every day, and we probably don't even know it. I think the sustainability of server farms and, and data centers are amazing, right? Because what's happened over the past 10 years, uh, these data centers have grown by 550%, but they've only started to consume, in that same period, they've only consumed 6% more energy, right? And, and it's amazing because it's happening at a time when we're both aware of the environment, but we also have a technology where we can implant and, and manage these server farms differently than we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, and if you go back to the Cray computers, this type of concept of sustainability and energy conservation just did not exist. And so it's an intersection in time where the technology is evolving, but we now have the capacity to also conserve that energy. And that's just reflected in the statistics. Yeah, so how do, how do this, these data centers evolve is a very interesting question, and, and it's probably divided, but, uh, you know, if you look at how we've sort of transitioned in these data centers, you know, we started off with CPUs. You could configure a CPU and, and storage, and then for graphic applications where we wanted to play games online, we could configure GPUs. And I think this evolution is inevitable in, in that, you know, we are going to get to a point where we have QPUs, quantum computers that are configurable and accessible you know, through massive cloud uh, uh, centers, data centers, if you will. And it only makes sense because as you get into this, you will probably still want to ask some questions of traditional computational uh, computers at the same time that you would want to ask a quantum computer. Yeah, so what would you ask a QPU? I think this is, this is quite, quite interesting and, you know, some of the, you know, there's been, uh, you know, a lot of discussion on this, but I, I think for me, uh, I, I w I'm a chemist by training and, and my specialty was in organic chemistry. And back when I started university, uh, there wasn't a such thing as a computational chemistry, which now you can actually major in. And it, and it really gets into looking at and modeling activities in the world that are organic, right? A computer needs a finite, uh, it's a one and a zero, and the way it looks at the world is, is very black and white. Whereas, you know, if you're looking at the world today, it is very organic. Things are not always black and white, and the answer is not 
you know, a one and a zero. And so quantum computers give us an, an additional tool to answer some of the more complex questions that are not black and white, but at the same time do it in such a way that we get a more accurate answer depending on the question than, than what we would with a traditional computer. What's exciting is that quantum computing is evolving at a time that we are aware of sustainability. And that's the exciting point, is because we can actually make these decisions now. And so some of the things that we've done at, at Oxford Instruments is, you know, as, as we scale up the refrigeration, the cooling, the dilution units for uh, quantum computers, we're making them, in essence, ex expandable or recyclable. So our larger fridge that we're working on today can actually be expanded and, and connected together with additional uh, units so that it expands and grows. The other thing that's exciting is that we've now brought into what we call the secondary insert into the process, which really allows a, com a customer to, to make their quantum computer future-proof by being able to reuse that insert as they grow and scale their platform, which is very exciting. Yes, so obviously, you know, when you're getting into some of the materials that we use in dilution refrigerates, re refrigeration, they are finite. And that's why a lot of what we do is looking at also different business models for supporting customers in being able to, to provide this kind of super cooling or ultra low temperature. I mean, one of the business models that we're looking at is, is obviously looking at hardware as a service, right? You know, where we're actually helping and maintaining that and taking that that ability to, to allow a customer to, to not worry about recycling and reuse that helium. We do work with our customers to reuse and, and recycle helium so that we can bring it back. It's not a straightforward process, but we do do that. I, I, I think the use of quantum computers in, in climate change and looking at the future is probably something that we have to bring to bear. I mean, we have to bring all possible tools that we can to, to managing the climate. And the, the beauty about quantum computers is the fact that they can actually mul look at multiple streams of, of ideas in parallel or multiple variables in parallel. And a lot of what we're dealing with climate change, you know, relate to, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the CO2, whether it's, uh, you know, the temperature in the water or how much CO2 can be absorbed in the water or, or any aspects that we've contributed, such as coal production. These different variables are, are massively complex and being able to bring a, a computer to bear on them that can look at multiple things in parallel is exactly what needs to happen. And that is probably one of the tools that we as humans need in order to, to move forward. That's a good question. And, and how do you build a scalable quantum computer? Well, I think as, as time evolves, they scale themselves uh, by, the, by the use of the technology. There are holy grails now where uh, lots of folks are looking at trying to get or, or working towards their roadmap of achieving a thousand qubits in the next two years. And, and, and really it's, it's a lot of work. And currently I would say we're probably in a brute force phase, phase versus an elegance phase, which is why what we're trying to do with, with a lot of our refrigeration and, and dilution units is to be able to, to make those scalable versus some of the fridges today, which are probably more uh, bespoke or smaller, like an LD250, which is more contained and small and limited to, to their application, where we're looking at larger but but scalable and recyclable, if you will, fridges that can come together and mount together and be reused, and therefore meeting as customers grow their, their qubits, but they also grow their connections into that particular qubit. Every, the, the, the infrastructure scales with them. Yes, that's, I, I, I would say we do. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I always found interesting is that for the longest time, we could not calculate some of the distances within molecules and bonds. Um, and we weren't doing it very accurately, and there was a lot of variability. And there's been a lot of work now where we can actually do some of those same, connect, those, some of those same calculations and get more accurate results. Um, and I think being a chemist at trade and, um, you know, having met Linus Pauling and some of the others, you know, growing up and they were sort of my idols, the ideas of being able to calculate chemical elements at a more accurate but way, but also then being able to apply that to drug design is, is phenomenal. And, and you don't need, 
you know, massive, huge computers. There's been a lot of talk today about what, how low in qubits can you go to actually get functional uh, uh, results. And, and, it's, and it is achievable and it is happening. Yes, to, to get the scalable uh, quantum computers, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of work around uh, the environment in which they live in and, and maintaining that stability. You know, what you have to remember is that when you're creating a qubit, they are influenced by the external world and, and the ability to, to make them, you know, uh, quiet and, and, and isolated from the rest of the world is fundamental and, and that gets into error correction and latency and, and how we work with them and communicate to them, which is fundamentally, you know, how you control the environment and scale that environment uh, and, and do it appropriately. It also, you know, I think we're certainly at an inflection point where we're probably going to go from brute force to elegance. And being able to, to work to do that is, is the focus. Yeah, the brute force to elegance is, you know, if you look back in, in any point when we've sort of evolved, you know, as humans, whether it's the Industrial Revolution or, you know, trains to planes or, you know, there's always this point where you reach an inflection point where uh, things change and things evolve. And right now there's a lot of connections between uh, the qubit itself and, and uh, wiring and then into external electronics at room temperature. And I think that whole concept of how does that, that chain collapse and how does that evolve is fundamentally the evolution into, into elegance. And, and there's a lot of activity around taking electronics to being to colder temperatures and moving into cold electronics. I think everybody has a responsibility. Uh, I think, you know, we, we talked earlier about climate change. We need these tools to make a difference in the world, right? Uh, we, we've just lived through or everything going to plan. We're coming out of pandemic, right? We have to get to the point where we're evolving out of this and we need all these tools to really move and to enable our next generations. And I, I think from that standpoint, it's up to all of us, including, uh, for example, even myself at, at Oxford Instruments, to be responsible to, to take care of the environment. I mean, one of the exciting things for us is that over the past year, we've moved all of our manufacturing to 100% renewable energy. That is a responsibility and a choice that we've made as Oxford Instruments. At the same time, we're also now moving our manufacturing to be zero impact on landfills. These are things that we do to actually make a difference and that we own and that we want to do as responsible corporate citizens, and that's what we believe in. And I think it comes upon us and everybody involved in that long equation of supply and technology development to take that ownership. Wow, that, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, from my standpoint, uh, any, any form of technology that allows us to answer the question faster and quicker, given where we are in our evolution as humans, is absolutely fundamental in saving time, right? You know, we can't keep at the same pace that we're going. So to some extent, if we burn a little bit of energy here, moving forward with regards to quantum, but it saves us, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now, falling off this, this dreaded cliff of whatever that might be, I think that's the risk that we have to take. We spoke earlier about uh, being a trained chemist, and particularly a, a trained organic chemistry. Uh, and, and my first job out of university was actually looking at mapping electronegativity ne electro sites between receptors uh, of, of drugs to fight cancer. These are complex equations, right? And, and, and even some of the equations that we have today in how chemistry works today, we don't understand them. Uh, we just don't have the variables and the understanding to, to deal with any aspects of the environment which is not black and white. And, and quantum co computers give us the capability to actually look at parallelisms with regards to how variables interact. And, and, and what's the beauty of this is that we are now, with chemistry, able to start to model chemistry with chemistry, or in this case, uh, chemistry modeled with physics. And I think fundamentally that is the way that we'll get to the answers. Uh, and that's what's exciting to me, right? Because there is still so much with regards to, to chemistry that we don't understand why certain equations happen in certain ways. Uh, and, you know, and we've never known. 
And that ability to, to bring the bear on them, I think opens up so many doors, not only with regards to, to climate change, but also with regards to those equations and those elements of how the environment evolves and what's involved in that, whether it's from CO2 be, being absorbed in different materials or into the ocean, or their relationships with temperatures such as PV equals NRT. That there's multiple variables that phase into this that help us decide how these equations work, but we're just approximating to, to now. And to bring together a tool that allows us to do that and actually understand chemistry through physics, I think is the, probably the most exciting thing. Uh, and it's not only climate change, but it's also for, for the betterment of humanity. Well, I, I, think that, I think that's an exciting question. I mean, how do we actually solve that? Uh, one of the, uh, if, if anybody's been watching any of the X prizes, one of the latest X prizes now is about removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And, and, and our ability to, to actually do that and do that efficiently and economically is one of our big challenges. And if we can actually bring some computational power to that, to model it in a different way, and that probably involves the creation of new materials, that probably involves the, the, the combination of different materials together to actually efficiently and economically take CO2 out of the atmosphere, that might be one of the key game changers that we have for the future. Sustainability for us is something that we take very seriously within Oxford Instruments, particularly, uh, you know, we're 60 years old uh, here in the UK. It's, it's been something, sustainability is something that we've started a number of years ago and we've been continually improving on. Uh, you know, it's very important to us to, to look at this and this is why uh, the, the whole concept of moving to renewables is so important for us. I mean, 100% of our you know, electricity that we use in our manufacturing facilities are now from re renewable sources. And we've done that and we've achieved that actually over this past year. The next step for us is really now moving into zero impact on landfills. So it's something that we feel very strongly about, that, that we're acting upon ourselves. Uh, of course, it's something that our customers are aware of and, and concern them, but it's also something that, that we take very seriously ourselves.